Josh Haston here, Israel Uncensored on the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com. It is November the 18th, 2019, the 20th of Cheshvan 5780. Hope you're doing well in your part of the world. It's a beautiful day here in Jerusalem, the capital of the Jewish people. Thanks so much for joining us. We are going to discuss so much in the news. So much has happened, especially down south, since uh, we spoke last Monday. 400 rockets, and we'll get to that after the break. But first, we are going to go to the phone right now to talk to Oren Hasson. He is the CEO of the Lone Soldier Center in memory of Michael Levine. And of course, so many Chayalim, so many IDF soldiers, we have to thank for their service and everything they did down in the southern part of the country and all over the country over the past week. And many of those who are serving in this country are lone soldiers who have come over perhaps um, not going to college and not being in, at fraternity parties, uh, instead defending Israel's borders each and every day. And to them, we say thank you so much. Um, Oren Hasson, welcome to Israel Uncensored here on the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So for those who have not heard about the center, the Lone Soldier Center in memory of Michael Levine, if you can, just give us a little background of what exactly the center is, what its goals are, what its mission is. So the center was founded in 2009 uh, with the main goal of uh, former Lone Soldiers coming in and helping out the next generation of Lone Soldiers. Uh, our goal is to help out Lone Soldiers before, during, and after their army service so that they could settle into Israel without necessarily hopping on a plane and going back home because they couldn't find any connections to their parents over here in Israel to find a job, um, or even during their service when they come home from base and they have nobody to talk to, they, they have they have us. We have we have a clubhouse in Jerusalem. We have one in Tel Aviv. Uh, we have one that we just set up in Be'er Sheva, and it's basically in order to create community for for these soldiers to have a, a base to call home. So for people out there who may not be aware, you we're talking about. Kids from, uh, and I started to describe it before, kids from America and other parts of the world who don't necessarily have to serve in the IDF, but choose to do so. And when they get here, they're not just volunteers. They are actually full-time soldiers, many of them in combat units, defending the borders of the state of Israel. Is that correct? Correct. We also have another department that deals with Israeli-born lone soldiers, which is a whole new uh story in itself it's basically kids that were brought up here in israel and they come from families that are have broken homes or orphans and again they're dealing with a similar issue where they don't have a direct connection to their parents over here in israel but uh essentially we're here for both we're here for those coming from abroad coming from france or italy or america or uh, pretty much anywhere um and those from here the local the local kids that grew up in israel and uh we we actually found a pretty good meld where the israeli foreign loan soldiers are kind of teaching the american uh, or the french hebrew the foreign uh coming the foreign soldiers are coming in and they're basically uh they're they're teaching these kids about all their traditions so it's it's, it's pretty cool it's a nice uh, dynamic and the uh, center in memory of michael levine we could probably do a whole show no doubt we could do a whole show just on the legacy of michael levine but if you can Maybe just briefly uh, introduce uh, the name Michael Levine to our audience for those perhaps who have not heard about uh, this particular soldier the center's name after. So Michael Levine was born in 1984. Um, he's about my age. After high school, he decided to come to Israel and he fell in love with, with everything there is to fall in love with over here and decided to join San Khanim. Um, he was in the 890 Battalion. and it's, it's uh, para Paratroopers, correct? Paratroopers, the paratroopers right. correct. The IDF gives soldiers off every single year for about 30 days to be able to go visit their family, the lone soldiers specifically. So he happened to be in America visiting his family in Pennsylvania while the second Lebanon war broke out. And his unit went up to Lebanon and he decided to do exactly what he was trained for. And he went over to the airport and flew out to Ben Gurion and got together with his unit and um, pretty much uh, was in Lebanon. He, he did exactly what he was trained to do and exactly what his heart needed to do to, to defend Israel. And uh, unfortunately, he passed. Um, he was murdered by a Hezbollah terrorist. And about um, 24 hours after he got into Lebanon, he was back in Israel and his parents already flew over. And, and pretty much after, after his death and after his funeral, a bunch of his friends got together and said, you know what, let's do something in his memory. Let's set up a center for Mikey and uh, let's let's find a way to help all those those that are current lone soldiers through the issues and through the problems that we had. So that's 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 his legacy. We could we could thank him for having 
every, pretty much everything that we as lone soldiers back then didn't have. Yeah, he's truly a hero uh, for those who don't know. And you should, uh, I believe there's, there's a book out, isn't there, about his life? There's a book, there's a movie. Um, the movie's called The Hero in Heaven. There's two versions of it. They're, up, they're both on YouTube. Um, but yeah, I, I recommend that if anybody doesn't know, or anybody knows a little bit about Mikey, to watch them. Truly inspiring what he did. That's absolutely correct. Uh, no doubt about it. And I know that the Lone Soldier Center, in addition to the daily activities and all the program you have, uh, you have special activities uh, throughout the year, including Yom Atzimot, Israel, Israel's Independence Day. And I understand that uh, a week from this Thursday on Thanksgiving, for many of those lone soldiers who may be uh, missing out on their traditional Thanksgivings, uh, those from America who are here in Israel and still want to celebrate, you guys are putting together a huge party on the 28th, Thursday the 28th of this month in Jerusalem, in order for those soldiers to be able to get together with other uh, soldiers and uh, and celebrate Thanksgiving. If you can't talk about that upcoming event and let people know how they can uh, register, sign up uh, if they're listening, if they're a lone soldier here in Israel and they want to come to the party. For sure. So basically, uh, twice a year, we have pretty large events. One of them is Yom Atzimut. Like you said, last year we had two events. We had one in Jerusalem and one in Tel Aviv. Um, and each event had roughly between 800 to 1,000 uh, current, former uh, lone soldiers there. And Thanksgiving also. Last year we did it in Tel Aviv. We had about 800 lone soldiers there. And this year we're moving it over to Jerusalem. Uh, we're going to be doing it at Tachana Rishona. Um, to anybody that wants to get a little bit more info about it, they could go to our website at lonesoldiercenter.com um, or to our Facebook page. Both of them have uh, invites. They have uh, links that people can click on either to get involved or and donate or to register and actually be part of the meal. Um, this year we actually have a special guest. We have the uh, United States Marines serving in the embassy. Uh, coming down to have the meal with the soldiers, which is it's it's amazing to to be able to connect the the Marines from the U.S. and the idea of soldiers to come together on an event like this. It's it's really uh, something beautiful. Um, and yeah, yeah, the events on the 28th. It starts at 7 p.m. It's going to be at Tachana Rishona over here in Jerusalem at the first station. Um, and I look forward to seeing everybody come. And you're talking about turkey, the works, pumpkin pie, the whole deal. We're talking about the works, turkey and stuffing and, and all of it. Uh, we even got desserts. We have a bunch of uh, local restaurants from here in Jerusalem that got involved, some good street food, and, and the, the food is going to be up at that level that, that you just can't miss it. Can If I come, can we get some football on the big screens? Can we do something like that? For sure. So we have an NFL game pass, and over the uh, past Awesome. Mass screen, we've been watching it, and yeah. So again, give the website one more time for Chayalim, for soldiers who want to attend this uh, big Thanksgiving party with a thousand of their closest friends. Sounds great. So it's LoneSoldierCenter.com. And over there you have all the info, how to donate or how to register to come and be a guest. And, and it's all there for them. So check out their holy, they're doing holy work, folks. The Lone Soldier Center in memory of Michael Levine. The CEO is Oren Hassan. He joins us here from Jerusalem. I appreciate your time and uh, hope to be there on the 28th. Hope to come check it out. And thanks so much for coming on the show today. Thank you, Josh. We're going to take a short break and come back with all the news, especially everything that happened this week down in southern Israel. My name is Josh Haste, and this is Israel Uncensored on the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com. Don't forget, you can get in touch with me during the week, Josh at thelandofisrael.com. On Facebook, it's Joshua Haston or Josh Haston Israel Advocacy and Journalism. On Twitter, at Josh Haston, and now on Instagram as well. Short break for station identification. We'll come right back with much more everything happening here in the world of news from Israel. Thanks so much. The world, says Albert Einstein, is a dangerous place to live. Not because of the people who are evil, but because of the people who don't do anything about it. And I say that one thing you can always do is tell the tale. So I'm Rav Mike Foyer, and this is The Jewish Story. Join Rav Mike Foyer for the best Jewish history podcast, The Jewish Story, on the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com. And we are back, Josh Haston here, Israel Uncensored on the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com. It is Monday, the 18th of November, 2019, the 20th of Cheshvan, 5780. And we're going to get to the news now, of course. What a week it's been with terrorists from Gaza. 
the PIJ, so-called Palestinian Islamic Jihad, firing over 400 rockets at the Jewish state over a period of 48 hours. Israel then reaching a so-called ceasefire with that terror group. And even though they reached a ceasefire, which is nonsense to begin with, all throughout the day, I believe it was on, uh, was it Wednesday or Thursday, the terrorists kept firing rockets. And then on Friday night, Hamas, which basically stayed out of this round, one of many rounds, uh, they decided that they're going to get involved with uh, firing rockets on Shabbat towards Beersheba. As a result, Israel struck Hamas targets reported by the Jerusalem Post in Gaza after two rockets were launched towards Beersheba early Saturday morning. IDF believes Hamas was responsible. The rockets were intercepted by the Iron Dome. So I guess Hamas, uh, they're getting in on the action just a little bit following their, uh, their I would say, their rivals, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad in Gaza. Thank God uh, no one was killed on the Israeli side uh, in all of the uh, rocket attacks. I mean, it's nothing short of a miracle, 400 plus rockets. Nobody was killed. But another round, another uh, instance of the children, especially of Israel's southwestern communities, suffering. It's been now 18 years. We've had three wars and multiple oper operations against the Hamas and other terror groups. Uh, down there in Gaza. It's good that Israel took out a top leader there in the PIJ. That is certainly positive. A little less evil in the world along with 20 plus other terrorists. But it, it's it's not over. It's just a matter of days, weeks, or months before we have another round down there in uh, Gaza. And while Hamas and, and uh, Islamic Jihad, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, may not get along on all of the issues, it seems that they are working to uh, defuse uh, tensions reported by the Jerusalem Post and strengthen their ties. According to Khalid Abu Tuame, Hamas and PIJ officials said over the weekend, relations between the two groups will remain strong despite differences over last week's round of fighting with Israel. So one thing they, that they can agree on, even though they may have issues with, with each other, with uh, the issues re in regard to Israel in terms of wanting to destroy the Jewish state, with that they certainly can agree on. And they just have to find a way to work together uh, with a more of a uh, friendly environment. That's basically that's basically what they're saying. My problem with the whole thing is that both terror groups are still standing, Hamas and PIJ, and the fact that literally after this so-called ceasefire, which it was a joke to begin with, went into effect, Israel then once again lined up the trucks and started bringing in uh, goods to Gaza, which we know are just used by Hamas and other terror groups to continue down their path of uh, rocket firing and building of the terror tunnels. So why we supply Gaza with anything, I just, I just don't get it when we're just enabling them to turn around and to attack us. At the same time, uh, TOI reports that the parents of uh, IDF soldier uh, Hadar Golden, who was killed during, also during a ceasefire, if I'm not mistaken, during Operation Protective Edge. They are um, very upset that this ceasefire did not include the returning of the body of their son and another IDF soldier who was uh, killed in 2014, we're talking about Sergeant or Oron Shaul. The bodies of these two soldiers remain in the hands of Hamas. So they were uh, extremely upset that in any ceasefire, um, it did not include returning their son in addition to uh, Shaul and two Israelis who are believed to be alive in Gaza. Simcha and Leah Golden uh, Hadar Golden, may rest in peace, his, uh, his parents said, quote, here, after five years and four months in which nothing has really been done, we expect to hear from Netanyahu when he will return the soldiers and civilians who are in the hands of Hamas. So they're uh, justifi justifiably upset about that. Uh, that was re reported by Times of Israel later on. Uh, 
later rather, um, late in the afternoon on Sunday, yesterday, and today's paper in the Jerusalem Post on Monday, there's an article in which uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu promises uh, not to transfer to Gaza the bodies of terrorists held by Israel until Hamas releases the remains of Hadar Golden and Oron Shaul, who were killed in 2014. Uh, the families of the soldiers actually met with Netanyahu in his office uh, yesterday and uh, discussed the issue uh, with him, the matter with him. Netanyahu also promised the families that no formal ceasefire would be made with respect to Gaza that did not, that did not include the return of Golden and Shaul. So, I mean, I don't know. I still don't understand what a ceasefire means. Uh, they continue to fire rockets. I'm sure they'll they'll go back to these uh, incendiary kites. I'm sure the the protests on the border, are actually violent terror riots. That's what they actually are. Will continue, and uh, what does that mean? A long-term ceasefire with a terror organization that doesn't have the word ceasefire in their or, or peace in their vocabulary. So we'll see what that means. But certainly, the bodies of these two soldiers should be brought back home. There's certainly no doubt about that. And as the rockets were follow, falling here in Israel, uh, the European Union used their time in order to decide to um, basically assist in the BDS movement's desire to boycott products from Israel. I'm referring to an EU high court ruling this past week, which stated that products from Judea and Samaria, Jewish products, not Arab products, not, not products in any other conflict involving land in the world, and not that I think this is a conflict involving land. We can get into that at a different time, but I'm talking about here specifically products produced in Judea and Samaria. The Europeans have decided that they will label them. Not only can Israel not put made in Israel on the products exported to Europe, but they have to write, we have to write, made in a settlement, according to this court ruling. Uh, Knesset Speaker Yuli Edelstein sent a letter to his European Union counterpart, to protest against the EU top court's decision mandating labeling Israeli goods produced over the 1967 lines. And again, check out, I wrote about this extensively in uh, in an article this past week on JNS News. Go to JNS.org and you can find the article there detailing how this all started with the Europeans years ago deciding that they would not allow Israel to put made in Israel. And now they're specifically saying that each member state has the the obligation that products which are originated in Judea and Samaria, produced there, must have the word made in an Israeli settlement or an Israeli colony. And forget about, again, any territorial, territorial disputes around the world. They're not looking to label any other products. They're looking to label Jewish-only products. An Arab who produces a product in Judea and Samaria down the road from a Jew he can write on his product made in a, in Palestine, which is a fictionary place which has never existed. Yet a Jew has to write, <clears throat> as of now, if this is upheld, made in a settlement or a colony. So that's uh, the way things stand with the European Union. The same day, we cannot make this up, the same day that rockets are being fired, they're using their time to label once again, to label Jewish products as they did 70 years ago. Speaking about those who have, a, uh, have no moral compass, the United Nations, the UN voted on Friday to extend UNRWA's mandate until 2023, approving the resolution 170 to 2. Guess who the two countries are who voted against extending UNRWA's mandate, Israel and the United States. Of course, UNRWA, an organization which seeks to perpetuate the conflict between Israel and her neighbors, leaving the Arabs who fled here in 1948 to Jordan and to Syria and uh, Lebanon, leaving them in squalor, trying to convince them that they should return to Israel, essentially take over the Jewish state, destroy the Jewish state. And this is a UN organization who is purposely leaving them in squalor, encouraging them to hate Israel. That's really UNRWA's true mandate. And, of course, uh, the uh, PA officials praised the vote 
as a huge achievement. Um, and again, the results, 170 to 2. You know what? It doesn't matter. You might say, oh, that's a majority, a crazy majority, 170 to 2. But you know what? Even if you're in the extreme minority, if your moral compass is pointed in the right direction, that's really what we need to look at here. The only two countries who are on the same page and understand that UNRWA is just seeking to perpetuate things, U.S. and Israel. And uh, regardless uh, of what the mob mentality against the Jewish state might be, at least at least we got those at least we got those two votes. One of them being uh, our vote. At the same time, the Jerusalem Post reports that the UN, in addition, get this, gave its uh, preliminary approval to a resolution that referred to the Temple Mount by its Muslim name only, Haram al Sharif. That's what the UN. Uh, that's how the UN refers to our holiest site. They call it by its Muslim name. The resolution did reaffirm the special significance of the holy sites and importance of the city of Jerusalem to Jews, Muslims, and Christians, yet they would not refer to the Temple Mount in any way, shape, or form as um, as the Temple Mount. They call it by its Muslim name only. And, um, you know, what's new under the sun there with the UN trying to wipe out Jewish history right here in front of our eyes. So uh, I don't know if this is just a, uh, if this is a, some type of binding resolution or what the purpose is in this resolution. Um, but nevertheless, uh, an attempt by the UN, again, just because they're the, they're the majority and the, those who voted, the countries 154 to 8, including all 28 European Union members trying to wipe out Jewish history on the Temple Mount, just because the majority does something does not mean um, that they are morally correct in their actions. That's certainly the case here. One unnamed Finnish representative, according to the J Post, spoke um, at this uh, committee, UN committee, and disagreed with attempts by Arab states to solely reference the Temple Mount by its Muslim name. So you do have uh, some out there with the moral, their moral compass pointed in the right direction uh, coming out against this language which does not reference the Temple Mount as a Jewish holy site. Back to uh, turning our attention down to the, to the south in, the, in this, week's, uh, this week's rocket bombardment against Israel carried out by terrorists in Gaza. Hamas leader, by the way, Hamas, as I said before, Hamas, you know, more or less was not involved in this last round. Nevertheless, Hamas leader, according to Arucheva, Sinwar threatened to crush Tel Aviv. He, yeah, he gets points for sitting out, right? Yet he says right here he's, he's going to crush Tel Aviv, promising to blow up IDF tanks. And he also told how Hamas uses irrigation pipes left in Gaza after the 2005, it says here, disengagement, I call it the expulsion, in order to manufacture rockets. They're using the pipes from under the ground, the irrigation pipes, from those beautiful communities in Gush Katif, and they're building rockets using those pipes. The head of Hamas, who's threatening Israel, and who has been made uh, mainstream, and he gets all these points because they didn't fire. Well, they fired on Beersheba, but that was after, that was during the ceasefire. It doesn't really count. It doesn't really matter. The rockets were intercepted. Hamas are now the good guys somehow. And here they're admitting they want a prize for this, right? They want a prize for staying out of the last round. Here they're admitting they're using the pipes from Gush Katif to build rockets. Anybody who thinks that still to this day thinks or rationalizes that it was a good move for Israel to leave, to destroy all those beautiful communities and to pull out of Gaza, I, I just don't understand how anyone at this point can believe that that was still the right move. Just, just, just tragic and just horrible, um, literally using what we used in order to irrigate and to grow and to produce and to do wonderful things here in this land using those pipes in order to fire rockets. Here's a guy who I admire extremely, Fox News reporter uh, who was in Gaza during this last round, Trey Yingst, reporting from Gaza, setting the record straight there was a building struck. Uh, I think it was a UN building, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Sorry, 
Palestinian Independent Commission for Human Rights, a so-called human rights building, whatever that means in Gaza, was struck by a rocket and Amnesty International went crazy blaming Israel for targeting a human rights building. And here you have this Fox News correspondent, Trey Yinks, who was right there at the time, who said Israel did not strike this building. A rocket misfired from Gaza. I was across the street when it happened. He reported, I want to thank him publicly for his honesty, for truthful journalism. And I don't think Amnesty, they tweeted this out, that Israel targeted a human rights facility. I don't think they apologized or retracted uh, their tweet. But I, I don't expect that much out of Amnesty International, which is not a true human rights organization. They are in Israel bashing Israel. There's all this evidence showing, by the way, all these reports showing how that they hold Israel to a different standard. This is an anti-Semitic organization, Amnesty International. They are not for human rights at all. At least not human rights for Jews, and at least not human rights for Jews living here in Israel. A little bit of, of sports news here as we uh, almost have to wrap up the show. Palestinian Media Watch is calling on FIFA, that is the... Um, the International Federation of Football or Soccer, if you will, calling on them to uh, punish the Palestinian Authority, the Palestinian Football Association, PFA as they're called, for refusing to let Arab players compete against Israelis. I'm talking about Arabs who live under the PA. Iran, by the way, refused, as it's pointed out here in the PMW report, Iran refused to let its judo athletes compete against an Israeli athlete. International Judo Federation suspended Iran for all competitions, yet FIFA has yet to punish uh, Arabs living under the PA or the PA itself for not allowing uh, their residents to compete to be on the field with Israelis. If they have a match, let's say, scheduled against Israel in some competition, they will forfeit the match. And PMW is calling them out on this. And, of course, Jabril Rajub, the terrorist in the suit, who is the president of what's called the Palestinian Football Association, head of the PLO Supreme Council for Youth Sport. He has prohibited participation in any sporting event with Israel. Rajub, of course, also using sport to support and glorify terrorism, incite hatred and violence, and promote racism. This according to Palestinian Media Watch. But not really surprised, uh, surprised there because, again, as I said, Jabril Rajub, Go read the book Catch the Jew, Tuvia Tenenbaum, who exposes Jabril Raju for being a terrorist in a suit. Yet somehow the international community and somehow Israel actually ignores the fact officially that he is a terrorist in a suit. Two positive sports stories to conclude today's show. Number one, uh, Lionel Messi and his Argentinian teammates arrived in Israel Sunday ahead of a f uh, friendly a match against Uruguay. I believe that is this evening. Uh, here in Israel. This is 18 months after Argentina canceled the match. Supposed to play, pray a, uh, play rather a friendly against the Jewish state. They gave in to BDS last time, not this time. Uh, according to I-24, a live webcast showed the team, the Argentinians disembarking from their flight at Ben Gurion Airport and getting on their bus, getting ready for their friendly against Uruguay. Yes, the match, in fact, will be this evening. Messi against his Barcelona striker partner, Luis Suarez. Uh, Uruguay arrived in Israel on Saturday. So this is a BDS fail, as people were putting BDS Israel, anti-Israel haters were putting pressure on them to cancel their match and not show up here in Israel. Arguably the best soccer or football player, if you will, in the world is now in the Jewish state. So you can take that BDS. And uh, I could continue with that, but this is a PG show. I continue my thoughts on that. Just one other uh, amazing sports story here. Israel's national anthem was played in an Abu Dhabi arena on Saturday after 17-year-old Alon uh, Leviv, Leviv, I think is his name, Leviev, sorry, took gold. 17-year-old Alon Leviev took gold in the junior category at the World Jiu-Jitsu Championship. The latest instance of a sea change here reported by TOI in the Gulf Emirates where Israeli symbols were banned just a few years ago. Um, Leviev competed in the 55 kilogram and underweight category, beating an athlete from Abu Dhabi, overcoming uh, competitors from Pakistan, Kazakhstan, uh, Tajikistan. Is that how you pronounce it? 
And following the medal distribution, the tournament presenter announced in English, congratulations, and now for the National Anthem of Israel, after which the Hatikva melody began playing. I don't think this was the first time. I think there was a judo competition where they played Hatikva in Abu Dhabi. But again, hearing Hatikva there in a Gulf Emirate country is, is pretty unbelievable. Who would have thought it was possible, but yet it did in fact uh, take place. The UAE reversing its policy of banning athletes from the Jewish state from using using their symbols. I remember they used to, instead of when an Israeli won, they would put up like the flag of the uh, of of the uh, competition or the logo of the competition and not the Israeli flag, and they would not play Hatikva. But now playing Hatikva, so congratulations to the 17 year old. Israel does amazing, by the way, in judo and all these martial arts competitions. We're tough Jews, man. I mean, the world tries to mess with us, but at the end of the day, we are tough Jews here living in the land of Israel. So God bless uh, these athletes. God bless, of course, the IDF and the border police and the security agencies and everyone, everyone else protecting the Jewish state. I say it now, especially after the tumultuous week we had just last week with all the rockets being fired and all the amazing work that our troops did to keep us safe, whether those manning the Iron Dome or on the front lines or preventing infiltrations and everyone else involved in keeping the Jews safe here in the land of Israel and all over the world. And that's going to do it for today. For Monday, the 18th of November, 2019, the 20th of Cheshvan, 5780. Shout out to Benjamin Bresky, engineer extraordinaire for all the work he does. Tabitha Epstein for getting these shows up on our website and everything else she does. Get in touch with me during the week, josh at thelandofisrael.com. On Facebook, it's Joshua Haston or Josh Haston Israel Advocacy and Journalism. On Twitter, at Josh Haston, and now on Instagram as well. Most importantly, between now and when we speak again, please, God, next Monday here on the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com. Everyone out there in the wonderful world of ours, be safe. Shalom, shalom from another, another beautiful day here in the Jewish state of Israel. Shalom. Shalom.